Welcome to this episode of Talking to the Dead in Suburbia. Today, our guest is Al DeGuido. Al has had tremendous success in his life, whether it's in the business world or with his foundation. He was CEO of Bigfoot Interactive, where he and his team built one of the most advanced email technology platforms on the market. He sold Bigfoot and became the CEO of Epsilon Interactive and then Zeta Interactive. Al received a calling to begin to leverage his talent and passion to helping children in need. He founded Al's Angels in 2004 to provide children battling cancer, rare blood diseases, and severe financial hardship with holiday meals and gifts. Over the last 17 years, the 501c3 nonprofit organization has expanded to more than 10,000 volunteers and has helped over 150,000 children and families in desperate need. So before we even begin, I want to thank you, Al, for doing what you do and bringing your expertise um, to helping children, to helping their families, because there's so many children and families in need out there. So, you know, thank you on behalf of everybody. <laughs> thank you. But you know, I, I always say that um, this organization, though founded by me, is really a, a, a conglomerate of an incredible universe of people working together to get something done. No one person can ever get done what we've been able to get, get done, but I've been incredibly blessed by an enormous group of people who work together and we do incredible things. Well, that's wonderful, but someone had to start it and yep. you started it, you know? You. Um, what I always you. like to say is that, you know, we all get these ideas in our head um, and some of us act on them and some of us don't. But when we have an idea, it's through the collective unconscious, it spreads everywhere. And so yep. you start an organization like this, you know, thousands of other people are also starting it. Like you get it out there and it spreads, you know, yep. without us even knowing it. So, um, you know, it's wonderful that, that you did um, begin it, but you had this illustrious, you know, business <laughs> career. Um, right. How did um, Al's Angels get started? Like what inspired you to start this? So I was a big, and still I'm a big football fan, giant fan, and a buddy of mine who was in the business, he uh, invited me to an event over 20 years ago now uh, at the Hackensack Medical Center. Uh, he said, it's a, all the giants are going to be there. All their wives are going to be there. Uh, you should come. I said, what's it about? He said, I, I really don't know what it's about. It's a fundraiser, but the, his company, CBS, um, had paid for a table and they needed an extra body. So he said, would you come? I said, yeah, great. So I went there that night. I remember it being a very rainy night and got there and the, the room was filled, as he had promised, with a lot of giant football players. And I got autographs and it was a lot of fun. And there were people having cocktails and hors d'oeuvres. All of a sudden, a woman came to, to the dais and said, could we all find our seats and settle down? And uh, she said, I want to introduce you to some women. And they're going to tell you the story of why we're here today. So I sat down next to my buddy, Pete. And the uh, first woman came up and said, hi, my name is Betty. Uh, my son's name is Todd. He's 10 years old. He's dying of cancer. We have been wiped out financially. We can't pay our mortgage. We can't pay for clothes for my children. We, we are having trouble even making uh, amends for uh, bills and food. And all of a sudden the room that was incredibly noisy went incredibly silent. And she walked off the stage. And another woman came up and said, hi, my, new, my name is Susan. My daughter's nine years old. Her name is Charlotte. She's got incurable cancer. My husband has left us and we're having a really tough time finding ways to pay for very the very basic things, food, clothing, shelter. She walked off the stage and two other women came up and I leaned over to my buddy Pete and I remember this like it was yesterday. I said, Pete, what is what the hell is going on here? What is going on here? He said, I had no idea. I said, no, no, no. Why are women, mothers with ch children who are dying of cancer, standing in front of strangers, begging for money for clothes and food and, and, and housing. Why is that happening? He, saw, he looked at me like he was bewildered. I, I don't know. I said, what do you mean don't know? That's not a good answer, you don't know. This is the United States of America. We spend billions and billions of dollars 
and mothers who've got dying children have to stand in front of strangers begging for money for clothes and food. He was like, he was bewildered, I was bewildered. So I remember that night I left, pouring rain, and I was driving my car on the way home. And all of a sudden, you ever been haunted? You ever been haunted? You're talking to a medium. <laughs> so you've been, I don't know if you've been haunted, but you've been visited. You've been, I've been visited. <laughs> okay. I was haunted that night with the words, what if it were you on the way home? And all of a sudden, that those words, and to this day, those words echo in my brain and my being. What if it were you? I was driving along, driving along. I started to think about my, my children who are young, in their beds, asleep and healthy, and my wife who is healthy. And I say, what would I do? H how would I cope with life? How would I be able to handle that? And I literally came over a tremendous emotion, pulled to the side of the room and, and sat in my car for about 15 minutes, sobbing, sobbing, uncontrollably sobbing. And all of a sudden the thought came into my head saying, well, these mothers, these women, these children are part of the human family. And we have to do whatever we can to help them. So I went home that night, walked in the door. It was about one o'clock in the morning. Woke up my wife. She was all that happy about that. And I said, Chris, we got to start doing something. And uh, we, she said, what do you want to do? And then she said the infamous words, what do you want to change the world? I said, no, I don't want to change the world. I just want to try to do whatever I can for the people that I've met and help them raise the money they need so this is the one thing in their life that they don't have to worry about. And Al's Angels was born out of that. And it was started, it was started with, we back in those days, we used to play Trivial Pursuit as a party game, right? You invite friends over, you play Trivial Pursuit, people bring cakes and wine and everything else. Oh, you're so showing your age. I did that too. <laughs> uh, well, it is what it is. Uh, a life well lived for sure. But um so we said to people, listen, don't bring cake or wine or cheese or anything like that over. Just make a donation to Hackensack Medical Center. And I worked at the time for a big publishing company called uh, Ziff Davis. And Bill Ziff was a tremendous philanthropist. And I went to Bill and I relayed this story. And he says, what do you want to do? I said, well, I'm running one of the biggest magazines in the computer industry. I know people like Michael Dell and Ted Wade and all these big guys. I said, I want to ask them for money to help. First full year, we asked them for money, raised $4 million for Hackensack Medical Center. Then we raised, in the second year, we raised $2 million for Hackensack Medical Center. Don Imus, who was a local you know, shock jock in the area, he, uh, he was involved in, Al's, in, in, in Hackensack Medical Center. And he started to do something that wasn't, I wanted the money, 100% of the money to go to these families. And he had other ideas about building ranches and stuff like that. So I, I left my being exclusive for Hackensack Medical Center and created my own 501c3, uh, Al's Angels. Because to this day, Anna, I am haunted by those words. And I, all the things that we have done, all the places that I've been, thousands and thousands and thousands of children in numerous places, oncology facilities, cancer wards. I look in the faces, I have seven grandchildren today. All of them, knock wood, are all healthy. But I look in those faces of those parents and I look in the faces of those children. What if it was me? What if it was you? What if it was anyone who's watching? What if it was your child? And you'd been wiped out financially. You don't have money for food. You don't have money for clothing. You don't have money for toys. It seems only almost like every time I say it, it seems like people are going, nah, how could that be? This is the United States. This is one of the wealthiest countries, if not the wealthiest country in the world. How could it be that people are living that way? But they are. And I always said that God put me on this earth. And I believe the Holy Ghost spoke to me that night. Put me on this earth to use whatever talent I have to help as many people as you possibly could. And that's how the organization got started. Look, you know, it's so wild how um, God will bring something to you in such kind of what you think is a random way, okay? Right. And I'd like to say that you're not haunted by those words. You're inspired by those words. For sure. The Holy Spirit inspired you to do exactly. this. And because exactly. you had all these contacts, you were, the, you were a great person, you know, and a great soul 
you know, to get this moving and going and, you know, the domino effect, you oh know, God. you help somebody, you, that person helps somebody and then other people jump on, they want to volunteer and you're getting money from here and there because you can, you know, um, you know, you've been graced. I think, you know, that's absolutely wonderful. And I think what we've been seeing these days through COVID and, you know, and the talk about how much, you know, how many people are impoverished and, you know, don't have, you know, the means to get by. I don't think that would be so shocking to anybody anymore that people just don't have. Have you been seeing um, some, of the, we, some of the well, COVID? I mean, what, oh, for sure. I mean, I think what we started, I mean, we, we typically our work happens around the holidays, right? Thanksgiving, Christmas, Hanukkah. Uh, that's the other big thing, you know, an angel is non-denominational, it's a, you're any religion, we don't exclude anybody from being an angel. Uh, but I saw that COVID in late March, COVID was taking people's lives, their livelihoods, their passion, their, their joy, and, and so many of these people were without the essential food items, right? So we're used to dealing in food, we, the amount of food items we do a year is incredible. So I, I said, listen, what are we going to do? We can't, we can't sacrifice our fall holiday effort, but we got to do something to help these people. So we started a food drive. And we have a couple of stores, uh, one in Westport and one in Fairfield, Spoken Duck Suites. We, we deal with children, ice cream and candy and all kinds of stuff. I said, what if we put some tables out in front of the store? And I started to reach into my network of people that I've met in Fairfield and Westport and other areas and said, listen, on Saturday from 11 to five o'clock, we've got these families and these different groups in the area that need food. And here's what they need. They need pasta, they need sauce, they need all kinds of different non-perishable items. And um, just bring it. And Anna, it's just, it's talk about God, talk about the, what God can bring and what, what God, God working through people. That's the important thing. We're all waiting for this like magic bolt to come from the, the clouds. It's not gonna happen. It happens through the inspiration of people. This week, this Saturday, we will we will mark the 40th week, 4-0 week, of doing both uh, doing these food collections for families in need. We have served hundreds, if not thousands, of families with essential food on a weekly basis. Now, people have come with their open up their cars, and their car doors, and gone shopping, and people are couponing. It's amazing. COVID took something away from a lot of people and part of what, what they took away from them is their not their desire to do good they wanted to do good they just fig couldn't figure out how to get it done we showed them a way to get it done and it's just been amazing it's been inspiring because there are days when we start out 11 o'clock 12 o'clock and you got you know one or two bags on a table and then literally three hours later you need to add more tables and and we're delivering into uh, shelters and uh, churches and and clinics all through the Fairfield County area uh, to families that need food. I mean, it's isn't it wild when I say that to you that people are walking around this earth today in this area within 15 minutes of where you're sitting and they need food. They need food. They want a jar of sauce. They want a can of beans. They need that to survive. So we've made that point and it's the response has been nothing short of amazing. How do people it's, it's, like people on both ends of it, like the people in need and the volunteers, how do they learn about you? Like how, how are you pulling them in? Well, the marketing, the marketing side of what I do, right? What I've done in my whole life, I've built this huge database of my customers. Of, so I've owned retail stores. I own Al's Angels. There are, like I said, there's close to 6,000 people on the Al's Angels list all within the tri-state area. So I'm a frequent emailer. <laughs> and you know, if, you, if people don't wanna get my emails, they unsubscribe. But what I always provide in what I, when I email is, here's how you can help. Are you interested? Are you sucking oxygen? Yes, okay, well, we need to help and I can make a compelling. That's what the, you know, when, when the Holy Ghost spoke to me, whether it's when God speaks to me on a regular basis, he says, use this talent, use this skill that you have to be engaging with people, to be a marketing guy and market this need. And we've marketed this need. And the number of people that will come up to me on a weekend and say, I just want to thank you. 
I said, what do you want? Why, why are you thanking me? You're coming with the groceries. No, no, no. We wanted to do something. We couldn't figure out how to do it, but we've heard about this. And it's, it's incredible. I don't think we'll ever end it because people just keep coming. And uh, it's, it's amazing. It's such a tribute to having faith, the faith in people. There's so much been lost, like I said, COVID. COVID to me has been a real interesting time. Uh, interesting is an understatement. But what it has done to people is they're, they're yearning, they're yearning for connections. And there are a good percentage of people who are yearning beyond just the familial connections. They're yearning for a connection with God, with their faith, with people mm -hmm. that need them. Yeah. And we're, we're facilitating that. Well, that's one of the reasons spiritually why we're going through this is to yep. sit back and say, like, we, we live in this hurried up time. We got to do this. We got to earn money. We got to buy this. We got to buy that. And now, you know, you look in your closet, you look in your garage. What are you doing with this stuff? You're not going anywhere, exactly. you know? And so you sit back and say, what is this really all about? I'm so blessed. I'm, I'm healthy. So what is this life about? What are we supposed to do? How are we like this social connection is not just on Zoom, is not just on the telephone. It's being with people. It's giving because we're born to help ourselves to heal ourselves and other people you know love your neighbor as you love yourself exactly. you know that's the greatest commandment so what is that it means helping and loving and bringing people up you know and what's also interesting i hear all the time oh he's not spiritual he's in business it's like what? <laughs> you know like wait but that's such a, a harsh judgment you know right. and what you know in your case you know you were so successful but you and you used it and you got to a position where you got to meet people who helped you create this wonderful organization so you took it a step further you know yeah, I think what you said before about you know i have the cars i have the house i have everything else you start to really at a point in your life who i'm cares? 64 Exactly. And the joy, I say this to a lot of people about what we do. It has been my belief. It has been my kind of uh, understanding. When I put my son, my, myself in alignment with the will of God, mm -hmm. which is to help other people, doors start opening up. When I put yeah. myself in alignment with the will of God, if I start to stray off the alignment of that alignment, things don't work out all that well. When people, and I've seen this, and it's such a blessing for me, when people have been involved with Al's Angels, I mean, I can tell you stories for hours of people that have put themselves in alignment with doing good, whether it's Al's Angels or a church or a synagogue or anything. When they put themselves in alignment with God and doing good, their lives change. I, I can sit and talk to you about miracles that I've seen happen. I've seen miracles. I think not, things not work out. But miracles around families whose kids were told they had a death sentence who said, we're not going to accept that. We're not going to accept that. And things changed. And, and the blessing. And the, I always say to God, you always, whenever I feel down in the dumps or I, I, I get, you know, I feel down in the dumps about what's going on, not going on. I, 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 he always sends me a signal. And I always recognize a signal. I say, oh, you thought that that was not going to happen. Magically, it happened. Why? have faith in god have faith in the fact that there are there are forces in the world that are working and engineering things to do good when you get in alignment with that you are on the right side of the equation as far as i'm concerned it also raises the vibration and when oh, yeah. we raise that sacred vibration people are attracted to it because they want to be a part of it they want to be a part of the joy they want to be a part of the love that is they don't feel in their lives okay they want to be a part of you know what's raising us up whether they know that consciously or unconsciously and so as you are raising because your vibration is very high because you're aligned with this wonderful vibration of god which is pure love so you're raising your vibration and then people come around you and they raise raise your vibration and then the blessings come in and the miracles like you know like i always say the miracle isn't walking on water that's no. just a sideshow okay the miracle is touching somebody the miracle is bringing love the miracle is raising somebody up and, and god does that through all of us we are the vehicles to raise it all up we're not these robots you know right. because if we were what a big mistake 
you know, okay. and we're not mistakes. Well, you know, I, I, because I've been doing this for over 20 years, we get people, people come up to me at different events and say to me, uh, you don't, you don't remember me. You, you probably don't remember me. I said, I'm sorry, I don't remember you. She said, but I was one of those families that you gave a meal to. Let me tell you what it was like when we didn't have a Thanksgiving meal and you guys showed up and gave us $100 worth of groceries for our Thanksgiving meal. And they, they tell you these stories. And, and she said, that, that changed my life. The, uh, there's, there's so many of those things that happen. And then I step back and I go, well, we really didn't change your life. No, 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 you don't understand. You changed my life. You gave me hope. We donated a tree in Fairfield at the center. It's, it, I donated it. And the whole, when we went to get the approval for the tree, the town said, it can't be called the Christmas tree. I said, well, it's not gonna be called the Christmas tree. That's not the purpose. The purpose is it's gonna be called the tree of hope. Tree of hope. And are we gonna light it? Yes, but we're gonna light it with all the people, the charities, colors that are out there doing things to help children in need. In the middle of the snowstorm, there are people that come there on a nightly basis to just spend time with it. They want that hope, they want that joy, they want that spirit. There's been such negativity, especially in this last year, oh my gosh, such negativity. We have to be evangelists for hope. Mm -hmm. We have to be people who do more than just talk about hope. We have to be people that actually exact hope and do something about it. <coughs> yeah, absolutely. How did you come up with the name, Al's Angels? <laughs> I get um, I get people to say to me, "Is that Hell's Angels?" I said, "I ride." A, <laughs> yeah, I picked you like a motorcycle. <laughs> I, I said, "I ride a motorcycle," so it's not Hell's Angels. Al's Angels. The name you know, Al obviously be because of me, but um, the angels because when you look up the dec dictionary definition of an angel, it basically the description is basically that angels are are beings of God sent to do His will share love i said that's what we're trying to do that's what we're doing that's that to me is the most rewarding part of this of what we're doing when you see people and i've been blessed to see them when you go out and you touch another person the connection that you feel is the most amazing thing in the world i held a hand i was in a hospital in hackensack actually about five years ago walked in and heard a little girl about 12 13 years old sobbing sobbing she was all alone and i walked in and, this, and her uh, aide had, had just left the room and she said she's really in tough shape i said what happened well, we just gave her some bad news and i said well why aren't you in there she said well we have to go do some other things but we'll be back are you going to be there i said yeah I'll be there and i was dressed with santa claus okay and i walked in i said what's your name baby she said sarah she said i'm so afraid i'm so afraid I grabbed her hand. I said, you like to sing? She said, yeah, I do. I said, well, let, let's sing Jingle Bells. You like Jingle Bells? And she said, yeah. And all of a sudden, her whole composure changed. And you could see a small smile come from her face. For that brief moment, for that brief moment, we connected at an incredibly deep level, that girl. And we took away some fear. Most of the kids that we deal with, are deathly afraid. They don't want to be in hospitals. They don't want to be in hospitals. The people that work in hospitals are really great people. But it's not home. It's not you. Your parents are got this tense look on their face. And I have hundreds of stories about that. But that child needed someone to say, it's going to be okay. Don't worry about it. We're going to, we're here for you. Be not afraid. How many times have we heard that? Be not afraid. I go before you always. So those connections are what I see as angel connections. When we do our bins, when we do our holiday bins up in Bridgeport, non-COVID days, we'd get a thousand people there. And what we got accomplished in three to four hours would blow the average person's mind, filling 1,600 bins with $100 worth of groceries. Think about that, logistically. But what I always said was when people walked into that building, they put their angel spirit on. There was never any crap, no complaints, no arguments, no nothing. 
is the most incredible thing to see. And I invite you when the time is right to come because you will never see a collection of that many people working in such concert and, and with such spirit and such joy and such love all in one place. I've never seen it. People, people who come once are constantly sending me emails about when's the next one, can we sign up? I bring my family, I bring my mother, my grandmother. That connection between an angel or angelic behavior, right? And doing good, incredible. We, and I'm, what I'm most proud of, by the way, I'm, I'm born and raised a Roman Catholic, but we got temples, we've got, we've got mosques, we've got these people, I always say to them, to the rabbis, maybe this is the way we're supposed to come together as a people. Maybe, and recognize there's maybe. one God. Yeah, it's one God, and are we supposed to be loving? Yeah, I don't care. I really don't care yeah. what you pray to. I really don't care. But together, with with uh, B'nai Israel and a couple of these other uh, um, uh, uh, synagogues around here, what they have generated in terms of toys for us, this year, Anna, we did over 18,000 toys. We did over 3,200 holiday meals. We don't have any organization. We don't have a big bureaucracy. We're a bunch of volunteers. When we're done, we're done. We go on to the next thing. We have no paid staff. Everything we do is volunteer. But what we have is we have God on our side. And we have a belief that people come together that says love one another, not love the people that you know, love everybody. Okay, so we that message has resonated so deeply that I literally I get emails every day asking people to sign up and be part of this stuff. It's an amazing thing for me to just. I'm, I'm well past the point of saying, well, Alice Angels, isn't it a great, wonderful thing? No, it's a, a movement of people sharing love, which is why wouldn't you want to be surrounded by that? I want to be surrounded so do by you, that. So do your volunteers go into hospitals? Where we, the... Prior to COVID, <laughs> we did. Part, we, we would hold parties here. We'd bring Santa Frosty. Uh, we, we would go in to uh, distribute meals, distribute toys for sure. Um, we work everywhere from you know uh, Yale all the way out to Long Island and the Bronx, all over. So yeah, we we put not thousands, hundreds of people, but we put select groups of people to go there. And we had been going before, prior to COVID, bed to bed at a lot of these hospitals. You know so, what? What's so sad is, as a grief counselor, I can tell you that statistically, in hospitals, dying patients or terminal patients are left alone between 15 and 20 hours a day. So, really? you know, and maybe that's a little bit lower for a child, but not that much lower. And, and the nurses, if they, you know, because we're human beings, if they think the person is dying, they spend time with the ones that they feel have hope. So it's a very sad situation, you very know, sad. Um, and to, so to go into a hospital and spend time with a dying child, anyone who's dying, you know, um, is, is so wonderful for them and their spirit and, and to make them feel loved at every oh, yeah. which way. I and mean, there's not enough volunteers actually doing that. Like, it's wonderful when they bring the dogs in and, you know, all of that. But, but you know what, though, Anna, I really do, because I've done a lot of that. And like, this is the first year we haven't because of COVID and because of restrictions. But I think a lot of people are afraid. I they're think afraid they're afraid of death. Exactly. They're yeah. afraid of death and they're afraid of, oh my God, is there something catching inside that hospital that if I go talk to a, a child that's sick, that something's, I'm, I'm serious. There are people that would donate all kinds of money and all kinds of toys and everything else. No, 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 I, I don't, I really don't want to go in the hospital. Well, why not? Well, I don't want to see that. That's the other part. I don't want to see that. And that's what I'm hell bent on always is I've got to get you to understand what it's like to be a child sitting in a bed with all kinds of stuff plugged into you and your mother or father can't be there all the time and you're scared out of your mind. Mm -hmm. I got to make you feel that because when you feel that, then you'll say, what can I do? How can I help? Yeah, but people don't do death well in this country. People you know, they can't, if someone's dying, they don't know what to say, they don't know what to do because we're in a culture where we feel like we have to fix and we don't understand death. And if I get too close to you, then not only 
or am I going to feel bad, but I'm hurt. I'm hurt by this. So your loss becomes my hurt. We internalize that. Yep. And there's the feeling of, yeah, I have a belief system, but I don't really know if that's true. And why would God take a child? Well, you know, God's not taking the child and it's hard to get our head around that. And then once the person passes, they don't know what to say. They don't want to bring up the name of the person, which is healing. Like to bring up the name of a I mean, I work with a ton of people who have parents who've lost children horrifically. And they want to talk about their children because it yep. keeps them alive. But yep. that's the biggest thing. How could I be around a child who's dying? It's so sad. What if I cry? What if I don't say the right thing? What if it hurts me? You know, and that's part of us getting out of that and saying, well, you're healthy, you're good, your family's good. And this, if you give that child, you know, a half an hour of smiles and laughter and feeling like I'm still a person because guess what? I'm still living. That yep. means more than anything. Yep. And they, and you know what? I find that too many people say, well, the nurses are there, social workers are there. No, 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 but that's no, not, not the what same. we're talking about. Not the same no. at all. Whenever I go, whenever I go into these hospitals, I've gone to those hospitals, you go into these rooms, they have superheroes, you know, decals all over the walls and stuff like that. And I'll, I'll say, you know, uh, okay, but we're there to hold the kid's hand. I mean, I, I miss it uh, tremendously this year. We didn't do it, but we're going to hopefully with COVID and restrictions coming down, we'll go back to doing it because it is, and I do it, by the way, I do it around the holiday time, right? So here are these kids, Christmas, Thanksgiving, Hanukkah, they're all coming up. And I'll say, what I would always say to them is, this, we're busting you out of here. You're, you're leaving here. This, we're not, you're not sticking around here. We're going to, and they would laugh, right? They would laugh. And we bring joy. When, when a sick child gives you a smile or laughter, oh my God, it's like, it's incredible. And it's such the fact that you as an individual didn't think, weren't thinking about yourself and how you would be impacted, right? But you were thinking about how your impact could help that child. That to me is where we all have to get to. We're all sitting down, hunkered into our homes, worrying about COVID. Go out into the world. You know what? God forbid, we, the day God wants me or you, He's going to take us, mm -hmm. right? There ain't nothing we're going to do to prevent that. So until that day, we need to be using our talent and our skill and our emotions and our heart to help other people. And that's that's what this is all about. I, you know, and it feels a good. lot of work. What? And we feel love too. You oh know, the more you give, the more joy you bring into your life. That's just the way it works. Can I can I tell you one quick story? Okay. Go ahead. So Hackensack Medical Center. I used to I go there every year. And it, it's sad, but you, you wind up seeing the same kids year after year because they're being treated. So I was dressed as Santa Claus. We went at the top level of the hospital. We went to all these rooms. Inevitably, you go into a room and there's the kid's not there. So when you go into a hospital, those have been in the hospital, you know, they're overheated. They're like, they're mm -hmm. on fire. They, they, they're heating the doors. So I'm sweating bullets. And we get to the end of the hall and uh, the nurse says, oh, Henry just went downstairs. Uh, he won't be here. Just leave him a gift. And um, so I, we put, we had some stuff on our cart. I put a gift on the, on the, on the, on his, the blankets of his bed. And I was heading the other way going to the elevator, saying to myself, ah, we're done. Now we're going to leave and we're going to have some cool, cool uh, temperatures. Well, the, out of the corner of my eye, I see the gurney come out of the other elevator, that end of the, the corridor. And um, I think I see them wheel the kid in. And I say to this guy, Tom, who's a friend of mine, who always wanted to do the, the hospitals. I, I said, Tom, we're going back to that room. He goes, we, well, you left the gift. I said, no, no, we're going back to that room. He says, why? I said, I don't know. We just got to go back. And Tom, if you know, Tom was a guy, is a guy who's a composer of music for games, video games. And he always wanted to do this. He wanted to go to the hospital, be there. And he was there. So I walk into the room, kids sitting up in bed, totally bald. And I look at him, I go, geez, I, I, I know this kid. And he goes, hey, Santa, it's Henry. I go, Henry, oh my God. And he's ripping apart the, the thing that we got him that, that was on his bed. And his parents are standing there and he goes, Santa, kid, this is what you got me? I go, Henry, I, I didn't know it was you. He goes, yeah, but Santa, this is what you got me? It was like something not all that personal. I said, Henry, I didn't know it was you. I said, Tom, tell Henry what you do for a living. 
He's why I compose music for many of the big video game companies. And his mother screams, I told you we Santa Claus. I told you we Santa Claus. And the mother says, Tom, you, you didn't realize that, that um, Henry is composing video games. And he's been looking for someone to score some of his video games. Oh, God, I got the chills. That's great. So Tom goes, oh, my God. Oh, my God. So the two of them start talking. And then I say to Tom, and I will never forget this as long as I live. I go, Tom, go out onto the cart. Get the gift we got for Henry. And Tom looks at me like you would look at me. Oh, they're all wrapped gifts. That's all I know. So just, he looked at me. He goes, just go get the gift. Comes back with a box. And, and he puts it on the bed. And the kid starts screaming. It's a Monopoly game. A Monopoly game of New York City as, as the, all the hotels and everything else. The mother and father start sobbing. She said, I told you he was Santa Claus. And he said, she said, she says to Saint May, you know, Santa, that what Henry does is collect versions of Monopoly games. And this is the only one that he doesn't have. There is a God. I'm getting chills to saying it again. Yeah, there there's a God. And we don't have to know, you know, the things that come through us for other people or for ourselves because God knows. God knows. And Tom has, the, Tom has, we took, we didn't say a word on the ride home that day. And he, every time I see him, he always brings that story back. The hand of God. It's helping a lot of other people, not just Al DeGuido and Al's Angels. All of us have the ability to do this and to be in alignment with God in alignment with his will by loving other people. Yeah, we just need to be opened up to it because God uses us. Yep. You're right, it's not that bolt of lightning that comes from heaven, it's the bolt of lightning that's inside of each one of us that connects us. And that's what's important. Can I tell you that there is um, a little boy around you who had um, a brain tumor um, because I keep hearing blastoma. Um, He's, he's, yeah, he's around you um, with two angels, okay? Um, and he has his hand on your heart, okay? Do you know who I'm talking about? There's a number of boys. <laughs> okay. But this one was um, maybe six or seven, okay? Yeah. Um, and um, he, he has his hand on his heart because, and the two angels are on I saw on on either side of him, because he wants you to know that this is the gift he's giving you, okay? He's bringing through the love to you, and that's important. He's also with an older woman, okay? Yep, yep. Uh, and I feel like she's related to you, though. Um, there's an older woman that's related to you, um, mm -hmm. and all I keep hearing is we're proud because you raised us up. You raised us up into another realm by what you're doing. Um, you know, you have been one of my most beautiful guests um, because not only are you so blessed, but you're sharing the blessings um, with the entire world. You know, I mean, I feel so honored to be able to just well, speak The honor to is mine to be able to, you're giving me this opportunity to share it with you and with other people, hopefully. And How to hopefully inspire. Yes, I, I think so. Well, how can people get in touch with you, become volunteers, or maybe they are in need and they and they need help? Yep. So um, my email address is adiguido. It's a d i g u i d o at yahoo.com. That's how they can get a hold of me. Um, if they want to volunteer, they go up on alsangels.org, uh, and we have a site there that gives you an opportunity to volunteer. Uh, you can e you can either volunteer there or you can make a donation. I can, I can tell you, so I, I appreciate that opportunity. I appreciate anyone who wants to get involved. We're constricted by the people we have, the finances we have. There are a lot more people that we don't touch that are in need. And our goal always has been to reach as many people as we possibly can that are in need with this message and with this love. So like I said, I, I don't have, there's no bureaucracy. There's no, we don't get big donations from, you know, major organizations we do get donations but we don't we're getting them from the regular people you know which is uh all of us so 
uh, yeah, we, we, we love the help and we love the support. And I, what I really want to speak to young people because that's kind of my, one of the things I think about all the time. We're trying to ingrain in the younger generation. This may be the reason I'm, I have gray hair, but we're trying to ingrain in the younger generation the need and the responsibility to love other people and to help other people. It's great that you're consumed by your life and what you're doing, sports and everything else. All you need is just a little bit of space. It's a little bit of time because we're not all going to be live to be 200 years old. And this effort, I wish it would all be cleared up. It's not going to be cleared up. We need to be able to have a generation of people who step up. And I'm blessed that I have a lot of kids that do this. I want more. I want an army of young people. You can, as long, if you can walk, you can help. Okay. Literally. So, um, I want them to come and get involved and, and start to think about this and start to think about things that they can do to help at other times. Because to me, that'll be the real success of the organization. Not that Al Guido got a bunch of thousands of people together and we all made contributions. We did that. That's great. We want to make sure this next generation understands it. And it's a really difficult challenge. There's a, there's a part of the generation that mm, not interested, but I see it with my grandkids. We're all under the age of 11, all. They get it. They get it. And they want to help. And they want to be part of stuff. So I don't care how old you are. Like I said, if you can walk and you're a parent, you want to get involved with your child, please definitely step up. Because we want that. We want them. You know, we live in Westport. It's a town of people that have got well to do. They, I don't want them ever lose, and so a lot have, lose the responsibility we have as members of the human family to help other people. There's no one else showing up to do this. We're depending on you. We're depending on us to get this done. So please help in any way you can. And you know, if you're listening to this or watching this and you're a parent with children, um, please, you know, this could change their life, set their future. You know, I have seen that the millennials and the next generation, they are much better than I feel my generation was at wanting to help. Okay, so, you know, let's let's bring this forward. This is a movement into greatness. Let's make, you know, not only the human race better, but this country better, you know? Uh -huh. let, let's raise it to a place that I don't think it's ever been before. So- yeah, I, I, and you'll know about me and what I do. I have no politicians, no photo ops. I have none of that stuff involved. I really don't, because most of those people talk a great game. I'm just being honest, mm -hmm. talk a great game but they don't really show up right. to do what needs to be done. This is all about elbow grease and getting work done. It's not easy to fill 3,200 meal bins, wrap 18,000. It's not easy to do that, mm -mm. right? We're, we're gonna be delivering, by the way, we did something for COVID, uh, COVID this year on Valentine's Day, I'm working with a, a forest here in uh, Westport where we're gonna be delivering 1,500 single roses wrapped for essential workers in six, seven different hospitals on Valentine's, the days leading up to Valentine's Day. That those roses have all got to put be wrapped individually. It's not is work involved here, but it's great work. It's God's work. It's how you separate yourself from everyone else. Mm -hmm. Oh, that person's a loving person. That person's a caring. How do you know? Because of what they do. Right, <laughs> right. And oh. certainly, you know, those frontline workers. I mean, we owe them an awful lot. An awful yeah. lot. So we said we do a lot of stuff for the people that are are receiving the care, let's do it for the caregivers. Mm -hmm. Let's do it for those people. And we put this thing together very, very quickly and, and got you know a significant amount of people in the Los Angeles database to donate money for the roses, $5 a rose. You know We're gonna be delivering 1,500 roses. You did the math. We did it in two weeks. That's amazing. You, you know what? Hospital. God will bring it through in whatever way. It just, it, it happens. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Um, you. That you were extremely inspiring. I hope that everybody else who watched or listened to the show today received the warmth and the love that Al does put out. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please share and comment and be sure to su subscribe to all our channels, YouTube okay. and um, our podcast channels so that you never, ever, ever miss an episode. Thank you so much, Al. I so appreciate it. God bless it. you, Anna. Thank you very much. God bless. You. God bless.